Good afternoon, everybody. Much better. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you all, and welcome to Douglas County Chamber's Best in Business Luncheon, sponsored by the Oaks in Douglasville. I'm Gil Strauss. I'm your 2021 Chairman of the Board for the Douglas County Chamber, and I'd like to personally thank you for coming to our luncheon today. If I could now, I'd like to invite Robbie Graham to come forward and lead us in our invocation and pledge. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many wonderful blessings of life you've given us, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, Lord, those who have lost loved ones, Lord. God, I pray that you'll just comfort them, be with them during this time, Lord, as only you can. Lord, I pray for each and every person that's here, Lord. I pray that you'll just, uh, pray, I pray blessings upon them, Lord. Lord, that you'll just touch them and, and the families while they're away. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with them and, and give, us, give us all a safe journey home, Lord. Be with us today, Lord, and be with the food, be with those that uh, have prepared it, Lord. And Lord, I pray that it be nourishment to our bodies, our bodies to your service. Go with us now in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Robbie, for leading our invocation and pledge. Um, next, I'd like to take a moment and um, recognize a few of our groups. Um, are there any elected officials here today? If I, I didn't see any, but if I missed any, to pause for a second for those introductions. Okay, um, how about um, chamber board members, visionary partners, chairman circle members, chamber diplomats? If you're in any of those groups, like stand or raise a hand or something, let's recognize. Great, yeah, thank you all very much. So, so thank you for all that you do for the chamber. Um, and at this time, I would like to invite our luncheon sponsor, Melissa Kemp. She is the community relations director for the Oaks at Douglasville. If you would come forward and say a few words. Um, about the Oaks. Hello, thank you for coming to today's luncheon. Um, <clears throat> I'm Melissa. I'm the Community Relations Director for the Oaks at Douglasville. We are a, um, an assisted living and memory care community that opened their doors about a year ago. We had about five fun weeks before the end of the world hit. And um, it's been quite a year. Uh, we've managed to steadily grow, and we're just happy to be a part of the community. If you are ever interested in touring the community just to see what we have to offer, or if you know of someone who needs placement for their loved one, please reach out to me. Um, but other than that, I hope you enjoy your lunch, and looking forward to getting to know each of you better. Thank you, Melissa. We appreciate your support in making today's luncheon possible. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Ray. Um, if you don't know Sarah, everybody knows Sarah. She's our president and CEO. She's going to come up and moderate today's panel discussion and introduce our panelists. All right, ladies, up you come. Oh, look, they're all, did y'all plan that to sit together? And I missed out on the picture, too. Well, um, thank you guys all for joining us today. Um, we're going to do a little bit, um, things a little bit differently this year. One of the things that we've noticed through the pandemic is, you know, and I, we talked about this at one of our networking events last year, is, you know, one of the mindsets for Chambers has always been the more people you can pack in a room, the more successful an event is. Um, and, and we have done that. I mean, you guys have been to our winter ball and we pack as many people in here as we possibly can, but I'm sure like me, you guys experience the whole running around, trying to see as many people as you can. And then you come away and you're really kind of left with, 
what did I get out of that, right? So um, our board has kind of uh, seen the vision of changing the way that we interact with our business members and with each other for this year. And one of those is to do more smaller, intimate, more strategically focused events. So um, you guys will see we're having a couple of events that are coming up in the next couple of months, or, or a couple of weeks actually, that are more focused on um, intentional interaction. So we will not have very large in-person events this year. Um, and, and one of the things that we, you know, silver lining within the pandemic was that, you know, we had networking events. I remember one of my staff was like, oh my gosh, this event is terrible. There's only 25 people here. What are we gonna do? People hate the chamber. And I was like, no, 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 that's not what's happening here. What's ha and, and, the, and I, you know, kind of we paused and looked around and I was like, look, people are actually sitting and having meaningful conversations. I did as well. Like I remember sitting at one of our events and talking to one of our Youth Leadership Douglas students and, and actually having the time and not having to worry around, you know, go run around and see as many people as I could and make sure everybody's comfortable. But I had the time to actually have a conversation with them. So, um, so we've kind of taken that shift in our focus with our membership this year, um, with some of our events and programming that we have um, to make sure that you guys can have a more valuable experience. So um, one of those is our new, uh, new series that we're starting today and it's our best in business. So we're gonna do these every quarter and it'll look different every time. Today we're gonna hear from four uh, you know, super dope women that <laughs> have other words, but I'm not going to say those, that, um, that are shining in, in their different generations that they live in and then the different things that they do for work personally and professionally. Um, we're looking to have some other speakers that are going to come in over the next, um, you know, in the uh, upcoming quarters that are truly rock stars in their, in, in their industry and in what they do. So um, we've got other events that are coming up we'll talk about soon. We've got a minority business and leadership breakfast that's going to be next Thursday. And uh, we have a speaker that is from the National Black MBA Association. And he's going to come and we're going to do the same kind of environment as like more intimate fireside chats kind of conversation. So um, I hope you guys enjoy the panel today. We're going to hear from these four lovely ladies. If you guys want to join me up here on stage and we'll get going with our, you know, our um, grilling, grilling session. all for joining me today. I think what we could do is start off, I know that a lot of our um, guests here today and on our uh, virtual attendees um, know who you guys are, but if you guys just want to take a minute or two and kind of introduce yourselves, say who you are, you know, kind of a quick little background on you, any kind of information that you feel is important to share. So why don't we start with Ellen? Testing part. Hey, good morning. Um, my name is Ellen Lynn McBrayer. Um, I'm excited to be here. We have been a part of the chamber uh, since 1999. Um, our funeral home um, is 71 years old this year. We started at Bella Reca, our Bella Reca Chapel, and then we opened in Douglasville in 1999. Um, still a family owned and operated, third generation. Um, I have four children. Um, we were planning on two, and then we had a surprise of two more, so I think that the Lord wanted to make sure one of our children would go into funeral service. So <laughs> um, they're, they're precious, and they all have a, a beautiful heart for it. So, so excited to be here with a wonderful panel of amazing women. So thanks for having us, Sarah. We're going to go this way. <laughs> Chelsea? Okay. Hello? All right. Hello, good morning, good afternoon now, everyone. I'm Chelsea Jackson. I'm the Assistant City Manager for the City of Douglasville. I've been with the city for five years. I've been in my current position as Assistant City Manager for three years now. I handle the day-to-day -day operations for the City of Douglasville. I oversee several departments, including the conference center that you all are eating against. So I hope the food and service is great, um, as well as IT, community relations, customer service for the city as well. Um, I'm a public servant at heart. My mom, my sister, everyone in my family is public servant. Um, from social workers to nurses, so it's in my heart is what I believe in. I also serve as vice chair for the Douglas County Young, Prof Young Professionals Board, which is called AMP. Um, so I love what I do. I love just helping individuals and helping young millennials and young professionals um, day to day as they, you know, guide through public service and guide through their positions and working their way up to the top. Thank you. Great. All right, Ms. Amy. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy McCoy, broker owner of my hometown Realty Group. 
uh, past president of the West George Board of Realtors, and I love being one of the top 20, um, top 10 of 2020 <laughs> young professionals for the uh, Douglas County Chamber through AMP, and that was awesome. Um, I serve in many different organizations, so I will not bore you with my laundry list of them. <laughs> However, it is an honor to be here. Um, and I have been serving in the Douglas County community since 2004 in real estate and have not only just been a resident, but as a business owner here too, so thank you. Ms. Dodd? Good, good morning, good afternoon, and I think it's entirely appropriate that you have the Oaks Senior Living since you've invited me to be on the panel. That was very accommodating of, uh, of uh, Sarah, I appreciate it. But uh, I think most of you know a little bit of the history. I've told it so many times. And they actually listed me as an author, which is a fairly new, uh, something for me that's fairly new. But over the years, I've been uh, in this community and worked very hard. As a matter of fact, where Sarah is standing is this was used at one time was the first was the first United Methodist Church or the Methodist Church. I was married probably standing about where I'm right about here uh, in 1948. I don't know how many years ago that was, but thank you for inviting me again. I'm a generation of the olden days, the golden days, and I do appreciate this opportunity to let you know how far women have actually come in establishing themselves. Thank you for inviting me. Well, and I wanted to list you in the program and, and everything as the matriarch of Douglasville and Douglas County, but you know, citizen of the year, and Miss Dot was actually the first president of the chamber. Well, back then they called it the and secretary. And it was the secretary, yes. Yeah. So anyway, well, thank you, Miss Dot. All right, let's see. So um, I've got questions, like kind of individual questions for everybody, and then I have a, a one or two, depending on time, for the group. So we're going to start with Miss Chelsea. You're up first. Are you ready? I feel like we need that whole, what is it, from uh, How to Be a Millionaire, where they like, do 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 Yes. Um, okay, so Chelsea, you kind of mentioned that um, you're the assistant city manager. We won't disclose her age, but she's obviously a member of our young professionals group. So to be in such a uh, high level position and managing so many people at a young age, um, I want you to just talk about what kind of challenge, like how does that work and what kind of challenges do you face being a young professional in a high level leadership organization? Okay, well, to address your first question, how does it work? It just does sometimes. Um, it just, I've been blessed to be in an organization that I organically have fit into that organization. So um, just, Growing up, my parents have always told me that set goals for yourself. You don't necessarily have to set a deadline or expiration date. My mom always says the things that need an expiration date, like your food, it's already on there. Um, but the things like, you know, deadlines, like your supervisor, they send you an email, that things that have a deadline. But your goals that you set for yourself don't add an added pressure to when you're going to actually get to that goal. Write it down, look at it, you see it every day, and make the strive to actually achieve that goal and get to it. So honestly, that's kind of how it has worked. Like I said, I grew up in local government. I have 10 years of experience, but that's actually my entire career has been in local government. So like I said, it's in my heart, and I, I get what it is. So I've always set the goal of being a public servant. I never set the goal of being an assistant city manager. It just kind of fell in my lap, and someone believed in me and saw that I could do the job. So from there, that actually meant a lot that someone said, hey, I want you to be promoted into this position, and I believe that you can do it because I actually can see your work. So I believe in my cheerleaders that believe in me and know I can actually get the work done. Um, a couple of challenges that I've had, um, I've always said there are three things that when I walk into the room, there are things that I cannot control. It's my age, because when you look at me, I do look fairly young. It'll increase over time, of course, but I can't control my age. I can't control my race, and I can't control the fact that I'm a female. So I automatically get that label when I walk into the room. So from there, I always say, I don't lead with that. I don't go in and say, I'm a black female and I'm young, because you see that. It's like, duh, you see that. So my challenge, though, has been that I have been so young in this position that I've learned to actually lead with my experiences. 
So I leave with my experiences, I leave with my projects, I leave with, I've been in two other municipalities and this will be my third one, so I leave with the projects that I've been able to accomplish over the years here and um, prior to when I was in Savannah as well as with the city of Smyrna. And that has helped me, it's what has validated me. It has, um, when people say, oh you're so young and you're ACM, and I say, but I've accomplished this. And th these are my experiences and this is what I've done, and this is what I do day to day, and what I hope to accomplish um, further. The third thing that, um, the way I overcome those many challenges is that I've learned to create my own path. Many times being young, being a female, when you're placed in another position, of course, other people have been in that position before you. And so they always, day to day, it's like, oh, remember when so-and-so was in your position, they did it this way. They took this path or they failed at this. And so I've learned to not let that get in my head because I'm Chelsea and I had to create my own path and set my own rules and standards. So once I've learned to say, this is my path, and I have to take hold of my path, that is our, that's the way I've learned to overcome those challenges that I've faced um, being so young in my position. Great, um, so I kind of want to be you when I grow up, but you're younger than me, so I don't know how that's gonna work. But that's great, and I think it's very important that you say that you lead with your projects. And I know just in working with you, presenting to our board, um, at our board meetings and things like that. Everybody's always so impressed with how poised and professional, you know, and I, I, mean, I think that you do a great job with that because that's absolutely how you represent yourself. So good job. All right, Miss Ellen, um, the queen of work-life balance in some capacity, um, four kids, and as I have four kids, I know it's, I always joke and say work is my break, but um, I'm sure that you feel the same way. Um, but in operating a successful business, a long time family owned small business, and having four children under 16, is Rick 16 or close? Okay, close enough. Um, but having four young children, how do you make, how do you make it all work? How do, you, how do you manage your time and, and still be a rock star at all that you do? Well, if I had the answer to that question, I think I could retire, you know, because I think I could probably sell the answer. But I, I think that, um, I think I'll, I'll go back and start, because I also think I forgot to mention the name of our funeral home is Jones Wynn Funeral Homes and Crematory. Um, and also Meadowbrook Memory Gardens, a cemetery that we have since 1977 in Villareca. Um, and so I think I'll start back in 1950, because since this is a panel of women, I think it's important to talk about the history before I talk about the balance, because it, it all matters. My grandmother was the first female to become a licensed funeral director in the state of Georgia, which is a huge accomplishment. I've, I've, I've gone through the archives to officially make that official. Um, the records don't go back that far, but her certificate even says he on it because she was the first. So, um, you know, and second generation was also a male and female, my mom and dad, and then my husband and I. So to have three generations of licensed funeral directors, men and women, it's, it's a balance. And in funeral service for us especially, it's, it's about leaning in and meeting families where they are emotionally, not sitting back, you know, and, and saying, you, you come to us, and no, we try to customize the, the, the greatest story of their life, because it's their loved one. And so from the very beginning, it, it was founded in, in faith and, and, and a balance. My grandparents did an amazing job, and said my parents, and Scott and I are trying to model ourselves the same, to say men have a lot to offer in funeral service, and so do women. It's a beautiful balance that you can help families navigate. Have I had... Um, you know, cultural challenges, especially with some faiths that don't believe in women. Sure, but then that's when we respect and love and bow out, and then Scott takes over. So we, we don't wear our feelings on our shoulder, um, because then there's been some, you know, a lot of women make arrangements for, for men, because, you know, statistically they die. Some women feel more comfortable with other women. And so we really have an amazing balance that we've learned from the generations before us. So it also takes explaining that and, and talking to our children in an honest way about, okay, so we're going to be delayed for this game, but this is why, you know, or dad may have to leave on Christmas afternoon, but this is why. To explain the heart and also to go back and celebrate those moments if they were cut short and really teach our children the balance and what it's truly about. Um, and so they're children too, so, you know, movies on electronic devices also help. <laughs> um, but. We also have our second child that was born, was also on hospice. Um, and so my husband and I don't talk about it much, but to have to plan his funeral while I was pregnant um, was also a life lesson that we learned that we also carry today about what truly, the, the most important things in life are not things. And, and 
my dad passed away on my parents' 30th wedding anniversary, so I was in college. So to learn those life lessons in an industry, to be able to never forget that hurt, but to help someone else through those moments. Um, the, the son that we had, though, that was um, on hospice before his first birthday, um, he's 10, and he's, you know, homeschooling. He's with my mom today, but, um, you know, he's doing great. He's thriving. We're fixing to face some more medical journeys, but being able to have an amazing funeral home family team, you know, family's not always blood, so we have an amazing team, too, um, that sometimes they'll watch one of our children when we go help a family with flowers through the car, this and that. So it really takes a village. It still takes a village, so... Um, to say the balance is to have trust and to teach your children that it's, there's more about life. I don't know if that's the right answer or the wrong answer, but it's definitely a challenge, um, especially when the twins that are seven little girls, two little girls, that there's not a, there's a fine line between the teenage years, I think, and the, the younger years with, teen, with little girls. Um, but I try to harness that very feisty emotion so that they'll survive this mean world. So, uh, but yeah, that's sort of my answer there. Yeah, no, and I love it. I love that you also include the kids in, in your business. Like, I know that we, we talked one time about the kids arguing in, uh, in the cemetery about, like, who was going to be buried where and, and the whole process, and, like, they I helped put the flags that. out for the memorial ceremony. Like, that I love that, that, that they're that involved in everything, and I think that that's such a great lesson to them in how a, to run a business and be a mom a, and all of the things yeah. at the same time. And I talked to you a little later, and I was like, this is an interesting moment that they're fighting on who's going to be buried by who in the cemetery. And I said, listen, y'all don't decide if you die first you don't decide but let's wait many years from now it's an odd moment that I had to call Scott and have prayer meeting right then there like let's just pray about it like I don't know here we go so. but you, you do what you gotta do right and you're yeah so anyway great thank you all right Miss Amy the queen of being involved in not more things than anybody else I know um, you are all on social media with all the places that you go you have two physical offices you're involved in I can't even tell it like you said laundry list of boards and accomplishments um, always on the go. So how how do you um, like how how do you manage your time? How do you prioritize? I know you and I were talking right before the luncheon about being intentional about what you do and how you do that. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. So thank you. Um, so my family. I grew up military. Everybody in my family was military. And um, shout out to Dad as he's celebrating his 70th birthday today. Um, and so my parents, um, <laughs> as they always start off interviewing the guys I date, right? Um, we raised Amy to be independent. So, you know, I don't have kids yet. Don't, you know, I had to put my baby, my, my puppy down. Um, so I, I, am, I am dedicated to work, okay? But I do have a balance because I do love what I get to do. I sell real estate. I love being a part of someone's life. Um, and after doing it for 17 years, the part that allows me to wake up every morning and just to say, man, I get to do what I love to do is because of the advocacy part. So it makes me become a more engaging with these boards. And, it, and like I said, being intentional, um, because my reason why is having, um, making sure that people that look like me have access to housing, whether that's financing, whether that's making sure that um, the LGBTQ community does not get discriminated from being able to have access to housing. Um, fighting for FICO scores to change. change. You know, really making policy impact um, is what makes me really love what I get to do. Um, because there was once upon a time where someone like me couldn't have it, so I want to make sure that we have access available for everyone to have it. Um, and so I take a part of with being with the Asian Association of Realtors, being with the National Gay and Lesbian Association of Realtors, being uh, the Real Estate Alliance, currently second VP of Empire Board of Realtors, technology chair for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. I was the past president of West Georgia Board. I served as diversity chair for the Georgia Association, and I've served now with the, uh, for the National Association of Realtors. I served on the national, uh, the uh, financing policy and housing, uh, national, See, there's so many doggone things I'm a part of, right? But all these committees actually make such huge impact. And now I get to serve on the fair, federal fair housing policy. So as you see now, the Biden administration is actually be, being very intentional and being more inclusive and things like that. And I love playing a part in that. 
Um, so one of the, the Federal Financing Housing Policy Committee, sorry, so many doggone names, <laughs> but when I served on that committee, we expanded access for uh, veterans to have more housing options and increasing the limits of what they could afford, um, expanding FHA availability for condo associations, expanding USDA loans to allow people to actually have uh, renovation loans accessible. So being intentional and serving on all of these um, boards, it, it provides a sense of worth for me um, to be able to say, one, because for women, um, there's not a lot. You, there, now, let me take a, another step back. There's a lot of women in real estate, right? We're, we're the number one demographic in real estate. However, being an African-American woman, there's not very many. You know, right now in the state of Georgia, we have over 100,000 licensed agents. So what makes me different from them is I put my money where my mouth is. I, I engage on these boards. I try to look at how communities can make changes. I looked at where Douglas County was before, and then I've been embraced by Douglas County to help make the momentum change to be a more inclusive environment here. And I had to go through certain things here in this county, but the outcome is that so that no one else has to go through those things. Um, and so that mattered uh, the most to me. Um, I completed the United States Army Drill Sergeant Academy at age 19, so I'm an overachiever. Um, and because of that and having that discipline has allowed me to be able to grow my business, be able to train up my agents so that they are better advocates for the community. Because real estate isn't just a for sale sign, and that's not to sound like a sales pitch, it really does make a difference when you have someone who is there advocating for someone for the opportunity to own a piece of the land. Because we ain't making it no more, right? Unless you're in Dubai, and it's a great place, and I'd love to show y'all. I visit there frequently, it's amazing. However, we're talking about Douglasville and Georgia in a whole, and I love being a part of this community. Um, that when I started here, I knew nothing about Douglasville, tell you the truth. When I started in 2004, the only thing I knew about Douglasville was the McDonald's on Highway 5 because it was my bathroom break when I was heading to the HBCU I went to in Mississippi. It was my stopping ground. And that's all I knew about Douglas County. And now I get to be a part of the growth and the stability. And that just, it's monumental for me. So. Great. Well, and I think that you bring up a great point about using your voice in different outlets. and. Um, one of the things I admire about you is that you're not just immersed in things in Douglas County, but you're helping build that footprint out in the region, in the state, and even, I didn't even know this, but in the nation as well. So I think that that's very important um, that you do that. And I think that it probably ends up reflecting back on your business because people see what you're doing in the community and they're like, hey, I want to be a part of that. I want her to help me buy, my, buy or sell my home. It, it really has. Um because a lot of the things that I do, not just for Douglas County, however, dissecting and looking just at Douglas County as a whole, it's something that a lot of cities, a lot of municipalities, a lot of states, they all have their, their thing, right? And sometimes we think that, oh, we can't make a difference. However, when you go to a group and you have like-minded individuals who actually can say, well, what can we do together to actually help get the momentum going? Um, hey, here's an idea. Maybe if we did this, oh, wow, look how much that changed. And it really just takes a team environment, um, but being welcomed in that space. Because again, in this industry, even though women are the predominant you know, beings. However, when you go to these board meetings, you're not always the dominant speaker there. So you have to, and again, as a former drill sergeant, I talk with a very firm tone. So, you know, there, there's those times where, you know, that masculine tone may come out where, you know, as women, we can hold our emotions and, and, and talk from a different uh, side of things. I don't want to throw too many things out there, but it's, it's one of those that um, we can dominate and complete so much because we have gone through so much. And we can actually nurture the way things should be versus just dictating. And I think that's what makes um, women important and vital, not just in, in this industry specific, but in any boardroom, in any facets to life to be, inclus be included 
um, should make the difference of, of hearing everyone's voice. And I think women have the best way of explaining it. Absolutely. And the fact that you're a drill sergeant doesn't really hurt anything. So. Oh, mean karate chop. <laughs> mean karate chop. Thank you. All right, Ms. Dot, you're up. Um, okay, so you, we're not, you've already reflected on that. You're the most senior member of our, of our panel today. And you're here because, again, the matriarch of Douglasville and Douglas County. Um, but you've seen and experienced a lot in all of your different careers and journey, your journey through life with the Carter campaign and you know, your best friend, Jimmy Carter, and all of that. Um, but talk to us about how you've seen women's role in the workplace evolve over time and what you think the biggest challenges that women face today versus in the past. Uh, this young lady, Chelsea, <coughs> talks about being young. I've had people so many years come up to me and say, I want to be just exactly like you when I get old. So that is, uh, that's a situation that I have been faced with for so many years. But uh, I, I found out the purpose of my being here today is not to give you all ancient history, but in 50 years to let you know how women have progressed and the progress that they've made. I think you've read in uh, recently there have been some articles about the uh, uh, ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, that actually never was ratified in the state of Georgia, but in 1972, Congress, and that, all it was, it was just, it said, you will be no discrimination uh, uh, because of your sex. And that was all. Women back then, and it did not pass in, in Georgia, but women bypassed it. Women then were not allowed to, they were denied a credit card, if you could actually believe that. They could not get a loan from a bank unless there was a male cosigner. That would be hard to believe now. Uh, there was no protection against, real protection against domestic violence. And the biggest thing I think was the wage inequity. And by, women bypassed that, even though this was not passed. I remember I was working at the General Assembly in the Speaker's office and a member of the uh, representatives came up to me and he said, Miss Padgett, I just don't understand why you're working so hard for this ERA. You have a fine husband that takes care of you. And I told him, I said, you are exactly right. I do have a fine husband. He takes care of me, but I also have two daughters and I expect someday to have granddaughters. And that was the reason that I was working to uh, su uh, support that. Uh, there was, we did have op opposition, and I'll give you a little bit of how we used to do things. Uh, there was early that morning, some women in a little freely aprons came through, and they dropped a little package off at each desk. And it was supposed to be the intent was that it was fresh baked loaf of bread. It was labeled from the bread maker to the bread woman. And that was how things were trade then. Well, we very gleefully found out, and we passed this information, that that bread had been baked at a local bakery and just passed out. So that was not, that was a little bit of trickery on that. But um, women, though, have bypassed that, and they have done it through the ballot box, They've done it through their education. Women in going into college have changed their degrees. And they wanted to find out, they didn't want just the crumbs of what was a career. They wanted the entire formula. They wanted to know the ingredients. They wanted to know what went in to finding out what made a corporation work, or what made a company work, or how you did all of this. And so they changed that curriculum in uh, um, college, and that was, I think, the, the very beginning. I think you all will agree to me that education was a major part of that. Um, in our society, well, we used to use an example for the wage inequity. There was a well-known couple that danced, they were in the movies, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Raise your hand if you remember them. Ah, all right, Fred Astaire always got top billing. He always made the most money. But we used to give him this argument, where well, Ginger Rogers did every step he did, except she did it backwards, dancing in a pair of high-heeled shoes. Now how was he 
uh, how would he be getting paid more than that? So it didn't get very far, but, but it's still, it's still, that question is still out there, I think. In our society, it was human nature to assume that a man was the, the top person. And I was even guilty of that, and I never forgot it. Uh, I was at a banking convention one day with my husband, but I had just left an important job in Washington, D.C. But I was at a convention and there was a young couple standing there and I went up to him and I immediately asked the young man what position he had with the bank. And he turned to his wife and uh, she was the banker. I never forgot it. And you know who I'm talking about. She was invited to speak here one time. Unfortunately, she did not get to speak. It was uh, Tom Morland's daughter and she is a partner with him. She used the opportunity. When she was given an opportunity, she used every opportunity. She studied and she became an expert in the company. And that was the reason she was successful. She just didn't go in there and say, look, um, I'm your daughter, I want to do that. But she, I think her name was Vicki. I believe that her name was Vicki. But, um, and when I was growing up, though, all the scientists were men. Even the mad scientists were men. <laughs> the boys were the wizards in math. They were expected to be the wizards. They were the ones in the labs experimenting with taking frogs apart or whatever they were doing. The girls were making aprons and cupcakes. Well, the, ch the schools changed all of that. They began to make a change in that. My granddaughter now is a scientist. She's with the Kennedy Space Center. And her last project was learning how to grow food in a plate. And she took this, this project that she worked on and now she's working side by side with male and female scientists. And her project that she had was sent to the International Space Station. I'm, I'm very proud of her, in case you wonder. But it was sent to, and that, they took the seeds and they grew their own lettuce at the International Space Station. So the future there is that those astronauts that will be going to Mars, will have to learn to grow their own vegetables and their own food. I don't know that Nikki will be with them. I don't know how far away that is, but I can guarantee you there will be a female on that spaceship and she will not be the cook. So, and she will not be baking the cupcakes. So uh, she'll be working with the people that are side by side with them. So. Um, the things that uh, I think the service I asked me and mentioned is the campaign that I was with and I was very fortunate to be invited to, well, very fortunate they needed volunteers. They were desperate when they asked me to go to work for them. And I went to work for them. But when I would work in a campaign, I was uh, in a unique situation. I was older as I began to, be, they began to know me. I was older, I was a known, element, but I was there also to lead by example because we had young women that worked that were not given the credit and I would make sure that they got the credit for what they were doing as well as the young men. And um, so that was one of the things. I used uh, humor sometimes. I was telling, you want me to tell that story? Yeah. <laughs> we had some University of Georgia graduates here. <laughs> okay. Well, I was working in a campaign one time and I was uh, on the phone raising money, some substantial amounts of money, and a young man came popping in the office and he was saw to meet one of the uh, friends of his and they were all University of Georgia students. Well, I love University of Georgia students. My daddy was a University of Georgia student. And uh, so he said, uh, Ms. Dodd said, I want you to come in and meet this young man. He was from Douglas, Georgia. We're still friends today. 
And he said, yes, ma'am, glad to meet you. He said, uh, Miss Badger, would you get me a cup of coffee? And uh, I looked at him and I said, oh, gee whiz. I said, you know what, we got a little pro a problem. He thought, coffee machine's broken or something. She'd go out and get me a cup of coffee. And I said, I am not programmed for getting coffee. <laughs> <laughs> So he went on his merry way. But we had a good relationship after that. I used humor I, during the presidential campaign. So one young lady came up to me and she said, Miss Patty, did you actually tell Hamilton during the campaign director that you go in the bathroom with him if he made any decisions? I said, no, I did not have to. But I told him if they made one more decision in the men's bathroom that affected me, that I would be in there with them. So, you know, it was not their intent to bypass me. They just didn't think about what they were doing. So that was one of the things that I was, was trying to get them to think about. The biggest challenge, I think, that women face now, and I had to think about that for a little bit, versus the past, is that uh, now, and I know all of you know this, but now women more or less is considered competition. And that puts you on another level. And so one of the things that women had to remember and had to, to my daughter got to be a master at this, and she, would assert herself and be aggressive in such a way that she would not be bitchy. And that was the thing that I think every female in this room, you guys can't see it, but every female in this room is doing just like that. So that was the thing that women had to cultivate. And uh, I think that knowing the ones of you that I see in this room, and, but we work together. And when I say Nikki is working side by side with the male scientists, she is working side by side with them. The women in this Chelsea is work, well now, we have a, a female male, but she, but you work side by side with whoever you're working with. So, um, I think this pretty much rounds up what I was going to say if you had some other questions that you were going to. But I do, I do want to say this in case she doesn't get around to it. Um, getting old, and I'm the other generation, is mind over matter. If you do not mind getting old, it does not matter. So I will close with that. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we could just listen, I could listen to you just talk all day long about all of your, if y'all ever have a moment, take this woman to lunch and let her tell you all the stories because she has so many great stories. Um, okay, so we've got just a couple of minutes left. So I'm just gonna ask one quick question and we'll just get kind of a quick little answer from each of you if that's okay. Um, and we'll just kind of go back this way. So Ellen, um, what advice do you have for future generations? I mean, we've got a lot of moms in this room. We've got a lot of grandmas that are in here. I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, but what, what kind of advice do you have for the future generations of women? And, and that's personally and professionally. Sure. Um, I think that um, never feel like you've learned everything. Always be willing to learn and open-minded no matter what age. And don't strive to be the best female or woman. Just strive to be the best. And then you cannot be denied. Oh, okay. All right, Chelsea, what you got? <laughs> Um, adding on to that, be a pro. If you're going to be a pro at what you do, do it greatly. Um, be a pro and also my number one thing before being a pro is always have some cheerleaders in your corner. Not only cheerleaders that look like you. Don't have a room full of female cheerleaders. I always tell this story. Um, everyone probably knows Aaron, but he's probably one of like the biggest cheerleaders I have. We were at a conference together walking through um, the vendor. Um, when vendors came up to us and they went straight to him. And Aaron's about 6'2", um, and I'm like 5'8", but with no heels on, I look like I'm 5 feet tall. So they went straight to him. They said, hey, can you make this decision regarding your government, or would you like to implement this software? And I, I stepped up, and I was like, yeah, so tell me more about your software. And he kind of looked at me, and then he looked back at Aaron and started talking to him. And Aaron just laughed, and he said, 
well, she's my boss, so you have to talk to her about it. So <laughs> ever since then, I'm like, get the cheerleaders, but also get cheerleaders, get some male cheerleaders, get anyone who's on your side who believes in you, and that will take you far. Love it. All right, Miss Amy. I'm going to mimic that with the cheerleaders, but you also want to make sure you have someone who's willing to pull your collar just to make sure that you are polished. So be a pearl, right? Be a pearl. Because you want to make sure that you get all those rough edges. One, you know, if you're growing into leadership, the thing about it is just even being female, there's a lot of people, like my motto is aspire to inspire. So you want to make sure that you are setting an example that allows people to understand what it's like to be in that space so they can see themselves there. You open the door for the next. But you want to make sure that for the little girls that are looking up, that you have your stuff together, OK? Because you don't want to look a hot mess up there, <laughs> OK? So be polished. Um, but be educated in knowing what you're talking about. Thank Love you. it. Our um, luncheon or our breakfast topic next week, it, the title of it is Aspire to Inspire. So I didn't steal your brain, I promise. That's just what the speaker gave us, but there you go. So you should come. All right, Ms. Dot. I actually don't know what to tell them, and I pondered on that a little bit. So I thought, well, I'll use myself again for an example. And I don't know, but at 80, nine years of age, I set out to have a book published. And I, one day I thought, good grief, at 89 years of age, you're supposed to be sitting in a rocking chair somewhere in a, you know, but you set out to have a book published, and that book, and it sold all over the country. So uh, what I get from that to tell them is do not hesitate. Decide what you want to do, and do not hesitate and don't think about, oh, I can't do this for this reason or that reason. Uh, just go right on into it and, and charge right through it and think, well, I know a woman that was 89 years old that had a book published. So if I leave that anything with you, it's just do not hesitate. Just go right on in and do what it is that you think that you, you need to be qualified to do. Amy, you want to add something? Yeah. just. A don't be afraid, even with your high heels, to kick the door open, okay? I, I say that, I have contractors that go in with me on properties, and you know, like I, I was joking earlier when I said I have a mean karate chop, because I, I rarely carry a gun with me. Um, and people are always gonna say, well, you just need to sit down, you know, just wait, wait your turn, um, you know, opportunity will come around eventually. Um, being a black female, it is tough in those spaces, but I've always learned that no one's gonna give me the opportunity. I have to go and seize the opportunity. So with your heels on, ladies, or your flats, don't be afraid to kick open that door if it's not being opened for you. Don't be afraid. Great, go ahead. I have one more thing to add to that as well. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, funeral service is a male-dominated um, profession as well. And, and I tell a lot of students when I speak at different colleges, at mortuary colleges, consistency you know the answer is always going to be no until you ask right so be consistent and also if you're uncomfortable walking into a room I tell my children this too confidence is a choice um, you know but when you walk into a room and you don't know anybody just pretend that everybody there's your best friend and just walk in and, to, and talk and, and, and ask and, and if you get told no be consistent and steady and, and I, I like what all you said I just wanted to add one more I like to, to kick the door down, but also, you know, do it with confidence and act like everybody's your best friend, even if you walk into a room where people don't like you, you know, because, you know, I, I told my middle schooler that a lot, just act like they're all your best friends, and laughter and a friendly smile always wins, so. Great. I think the only thing I'll add is that one of the things that I think is important for future generations is to never settle, because if you're in a place, it's very easy to just coast and be safe and comfortable, but at the end of the day, if you don't have your cheerleaders and people pushing you to do more and to be better, like just like we, you guys have talked about, then then you're then you're settling. And and at the end of the day, when you when you go to sleep at night and you're like, I mean, I did, I had a good day, but you should always strive to have the best day, right? So, uh, well, thank you, ladies, for joining us up here. And um, we don't have time for questions, but I know these like, that they'll stick around if you guys want to come up and ask them any questions afterwards. But um, appreciate you all taking the time. Happy International Women's Month. Um, you know, you all are wonderful, amazing human beings, and I'm so glad that we got to have some time together today. So, all right. All right.
right, Gil. That is a hard act to follow. Thank you, ladies, for joining us today. That was a very inspiring panel, and we really do appreciate your being here and sharing with all of us. Um, all right, let me find my notes. Um, so as a thank you for speaking today, a contribution is made in all of your names to the Chamber Board Scholarship, um, which funds a scholarship for a graduating high school senior each year. Um, the Oaks at Douglas Hill has provided our gift prizes, our door prizes today. Melissa, are you still here? Okay, um, Miss Doc, no, don't get, you don't even have to get up, Miss Doc. We'll, we'll come right to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> you just stay there. We're going to um, we're gonna draw for door prizes, and you are going to help us. How do you want to do this? Yeah. Yeah. Too. I saw that. <laughs> All right, the first prize is a case of cookies from the Bagel Meister. It says Miss Dot on here. How did you do it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the last three digits are 065. 065. All right, Ellie, awesome. All right. Way to go. Wouldn't work. <laughs> so no cornmeal bagels. A goodie bag from the Oaks at Douglasville. So this is going to be two four one. Last three days. Nail box. Great. Congratulations, Nell. And last but not least, a twenty-five dollar gift card to Sam and Roscoe's. Last three digits are zero seven three. Okay, now for just a congratulations to all of the winners there. For just a few announcements today, um, applications are still available for the Youth Leadership Douglas. Um, that is until Friday, March 19th. That's this Friday. And the Chamber Foundation Scholarship applications are available until March 25th. Thanks again to our panelists for joining us today and to the Oaks at Douglasville for sponsoring today's luncheon. Thank you all for being here and have a great day.